We know that people buy from people they trust. They trust people they like, and they like people they connect with. When a salesperson launches into their presentation mode too early, it not only bypasses the customer's mental trust process, it actually sends the brain into a place of skepticism and judgment. At the simplest of levels, here's the filter and the stages the buying brain works through. Safety, connection, trust, understanding, opportunity, and credibility. To positively impact your customer, you must follow the path of connection to credibility. Here's how you can evaluate this process. Can you quickly and genuinely create trust by connecting with your customer through mutual beliefs? This helps drop their defense mechanisms and gets you through the first three stages, safety, connection, and trust. Can you reinforce that trust through your understanding and empathy of their situation and or issues? Because this accomplishes stage four, understanding. Can you clearly show them a path forward that results in their success? In other words, stage five, opportunity, options available to them. Can you demonstrate proof that you and your company have the ability to actually solve their problem? This is stage six, credibility. To summarize, it's about creating an environment of safety and trust through connection, then demonstrating a clear understanding of their issues, being able to clearly and simply articulate the opportunities available, and then demonstrating your credibility to help them solve the problem. Following this order is imperative as it allows your customer's brain to work through its normal cascade of processing and sets you up for optimal success. Instead of thinking about how many possible people could buy your product if all the stars aligned appropriately, I want you to start thinking about who in the marketplace is your product or service most likely to help quickly and effectively solve a problem and then work backwards from there. So what is an ideal customer anyway? An ideal customer could be described as a customer who values your product or service, a customer whom you can make a profit from. Sorry, folks, but this is a business. You got to make money or you won't be in business very long. A customer who'd be willing to refer you to other potential customers. Start with the smallest market possible. If you identify a very focused group of potential customers that have the highest likely degree of success with your product or service, you will gain credibility faster and be able to expand your customer base. I'd like you to think of your ideal customer through the ready, willing, and able framework. Let's take a look at them one at a time. First, are they ready? Issue, do they have a problem that they need solved? Awareness. Do they know they have a problem? Motivation. Do they have a sense of urgency to solve their problem? Next up, are they willing? And this starts with timing. Are they ready to solve the problem today? Are they searching? Are they currently looking for solutions to solve their problem? And finally, are they able? The first category here is money. Do they have the budget to solve the problem? Next is authority. Do they have permission or approval or the decision-making authority to actually solve the problem? Now, how do we find these customers that are ready, willing, and able? Start by creating ideal customer personas or profiles. Customer personas include the following information. What's the ideal industry your best potential customer is in? The ideal title or experience that they have? What's the ideal buying cycle for your product? Meaning, is the customer ready, willing, and able to purchase your product when you need them to? And then the ideal location, meaning your product or solution is geographically aligned to where your best customer is also located. One of the easiest ways to get started with customer personas is to build them around your best current customers. If you've got a handful of great customers today who love and appreciate you and your product, then you're going to want to clone them. By building your personas around them, you create the exact profile for your next best new customer. 
Using these customer personas and the ready, willing, and able filter, you should be able to quickly narrow your pool of prospective buyers and qualify them much more efficiently. If you don't have this type of information readily available, talk to the person responsible for marketing at your company. They should be able to provide you these types of profiles. If you're a small business and you are both the sales and marketing departments, you basically have two choices. First, you can do the research yourself with the help of Google, LinkedIn, and others, or you can hire a market research company to help you build these target profiles based on your input and their expertise. Remember, the key is to find the narrowest group of customers with whom you can develop a quick and effective partnership by helping them solve their urgent problem. And you can expand from there. The key is to understand the customer's issues through their lens, not yours. The only way to do this is to ask experiential questions that allow the customer to really dig deep into their issues. Now let me introduce you to the easiest yet most powerful framework under the sun that will help you navigate this crucial sales success area. It's called the four I's. The first I is to uncover the issue. If there's more than one issue, it's very important to help the customer prioritize them. That way you can address the most urgent issues. The second I to identify is the impact the issue is having on the customer. This is where you will quantify the problem. If you fail to quantify the problem, then the customer won't have a relative comparison to value when you reveal the price of your solution. The third I is invasiveness. This is really a subset of impact, but reaches across the customer's organization and looks for the broader impact the issue may have. For example, if I can't improve my new business acquisition, then I can't hire more people, or worse yet, I may have to lay people off. Invasiveness can be any larger impact on the business that results in not solving this particular problem. The final I is iceberg. This is the giant barrier that has prevented the customer from solving the problem prior to your meeting. Generally speaking, icebergs tend to be knowledge, time, and or budget or money. By addressing this area, you will reveal any potential objections the customer may have as to what will prevent them from moving forward with your solution. We've talked in great deal at this point about how customers make a purchase to solve a problem. That problem can be intrinsic or extrinsic, but either way, when we make a purchase, we feel like we are filling a need. Regardless of what we are buying, there are particular triggers or motivators that push us over the edge from window shopper to new customer. These motivators are key to understand as each of your potential new customers will have one or more that will need to be met in order to secure, well, your order. These are in no particular order as each buyer will be different. The first motivator we will discuss is price. How much something costs can be, and in many cases is a large motivator in a buyer's decision. As with all purchases, I can use this to justify why I don't purchase or why I do purchase. The next motivator that tends to go along with price but is much deeper is value. People who are motivated by value are weighing the benefit of your product or service compared to the price that you're asking. The higher the perceived value, the more I'm willing to pay. Next up, we have quality. This motivator tends to go hand in glove with value. The difference between the two is where value is a perception of benefit versus price, quality is strictly the perception of caliber of the product or service. The fourth motivator is self-preservation. This scenario is when I feel that I must make a purchase in order to secure a promotion, prevent a demotion, or simply in more practical terms, protect my family or myself. This motivator is driven primarily by fear and is a highly emotional motivator. In a business-to-business -business sales setting, it's very difficult to uncover this motivator. Finally, the last motivator we will cover is social pressure. Many people buy products today based on who they know personally has recently bought the same product. 
This motivator derives from the groupthink mentality and the subconscious feeling of the need to fit in or belong. You know, to not miss out. Many products today have gained mass market appeal simply by leveraging the motivation of social pressure. Why do you have the cell phone you have? What about the car you drive? How about the neighborhood you live in? Many subconscious factors go into the social pressure motivator, but it can be a strong ally in your sales approach if your product or service has the type of mass market reputation that creates a buzz in the mind of your prospective customer. These are the primary motivators of why customers buy. Once they know they have a problem and have decided to attempt to solve it, one or more of these motivators will help them pull the trigger. Your goal is to determine through your research and conversation which motivator is having the largest impact on their decision. Can you think of something that you've recently changed? Satellite provider, cell phone carrier, insurance? Change is hard for the vast majority of human beings, isn't it? Getting your customer to change is equally as hard. Let's talk about the change process and then go a little deeper into the barriers that prevent us from changing. In order to change, in particular from a consumer standpoint, we go through what I call the purchase change equation. Awareness plus motivation plus ability equals change. Step one is, does your customer have the awareness that they need to change or even that other options are available? The next step, step two, is how motivated are they to make the change? Is there enough pain, etc.? Change seldom occurs until the pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of change. Let that one sink in. Step three, how easily can they implement the change? If you have a great product or service, but your lead times are six months out, you've made it much more difficult for me to change to your product. Even though the right level of awareness combined with the right level of motivation and the ease or ability to implement leads to the greatest likelihood of change, there are still several unconscious barriers that we all have to accepting change. The first is anxiety. When faced with a change, human beings tend to get really anxious. They do this due to the fact that they have the subconscious feeling that they are going to take a risk and don't know what the outcome will be. So what's the solution? Ensure there's trust in the relationship first, and then be mindful to continually speak to what the customer can expect from your partnership. Remove the unexpected and unknown, and you'll remove the anxiety barrier. The next barrier is the feeling of isolation. When faced with a change, humans tend to draw inward and feel isolated. We don't do this consciously. It's at a subconscious level. It stems from our internal fight-or-flight mechanism and that we need to hunker down and get through this change. So what's the solution? Ensure the customer understands how many other customers have been in their exact shoes and the results they have experienced by working with you. In addition, provide them with direct access to a couple of really satisfied customers who will walk them through their positive experience. Do this successfully, and they will move from a feeling of isolation to an excitement of being part of something that's already successful. The next barrier is the feeling of potential loss. Because humans primarily view change as bad, especially change that we didn't choose ourselves, we tend to look at the change cup as half empty rather than half full. As a result, we start looking for things we will lose or have to give up to make the change. It's part of our self-preservation mechanism buried deep within our subconscious. So what's the solution to this? Make sure you're using positive language that continually highlights what the customer will gain by making a change. The next barrier customers face is we can only take so much change at one time. I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. I once knew a person who moved twice, switched jobs, got divorced, and lost their father all in the same year. Overwhelming to say the least. Our brains are wired to handle only so many changes at once. If you try to sell more than one solution at a time to your customer, they may start to feel overwhelmed and not end up buying anything. What's the solution to this? Focus the customer at one incremental change at a time. Baby steps is the key. The next barrier is when the pressure to change is off, 
we tend to revert back to our old way. So referring back to the change equation, if my awareness is high, but my motivation really isn't, then the minute you walk out of my door, no matter how excited you made me feel about your product, I will likely go right back to doing business the same way as before you came. What's the solution? Make sure you spend enough time really diving into the customer's issues and spend as much time as necessary quantifying those issues. That will drive up the motivation and urgency and the likelihood that they will make the change then and there. So in summary, it's really about your ability to help navigate your customer through the awareness plus motivation plus ability equation, all while keeping in mind the five subconscious potential barriers to change. Do so effectively, and you will ensure the sale and create trust and loyalty in the process. Products and services are simply the vehicles that delivers the solution. Let's look at the formal definition of a product versus a solution. A product, simply defined, is an article or substance that's manufactured or refined for sale. Make sense, right? A solution is defined as a means of solving a problem or dealing with a difficult situation. See, the product may be the means, but the solution is most certainly the end. People buy solutions, not products. Now, I'm not sure about you, but where most salespeople run off the rails is that they try to sell products instead of solutions. They communicate the facts and the features and the figures and the opinions around the physical characteristics of their products rather than the process of arriving at a positive solution for the customer. So here's what I want you to do. Take a moment and make a list of all the solutions your product or service solves. Next, I want you to think about how you can ask better questions to get your customers focused on the solution to their problem first and then use your product to solve it. What is it that distinguishes you from me? You may have black hair where I have blonde. You might be five feet nine where I'm over six feet tall. You may have long hair where mine is short. You get the point. It's our features that are the obvious initial characteristics that allow us to tell one person from the next. In certain circumstances, the benefits of those features may allow for one person to have an advantage over another. Now, when it comes to your product or service, it's critical to understand all your features, but it's the benefit of the feature that the customer needs to see as critical to solving their problem, and as importantly, the advantage your solution creates compared to other options that they have available to solve their problem. Many salespeople are wonderful at spouting the facts and data to describe all the wonderful features of their product or service, but great salespeople they know all the details of their customer's problem they are solving and can relate the benefit of the features of their product plus the resulting feeling the customer gets having used your solution to solve it. They do this while at the same time creating differentiating space from their competition by ensuring the advantage they possess over the competitor comes through loud and clear. Here's the application. If you haven't already done so in previous lessons, I'd like for you to make a list of the top five problems that your customers tend to have. Make them problems that your product or service can solve. Next, I want you to list out the top five to 10 features your product possesses. Next after that, next to each feature, I'd like you to list the benefit that that feature has to your customer in a way or manner in which it helps solve or leads to solving the problem. Finally, Next to that, list the advantage that feature and benefit has over alternative or competitive solutions your customer might be considering. If you can successfully do this across the board, it will be extremely easy for your customer to see you as the obvious choice for their solution. Now, if you find that you come out on the losing side of each feature benefit advantage exercise, you might wanna find a new product or service to market. We want proof. The need for proof that a product or service actually does what it says it does is rooted deep in our brain's subconscious mechanisms that drive self-preservation. We don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to get fooled. That will cause pain and we like to avoid pain. Proof that a product or solution works helps us minimize that risk. Now, when it comes to the proof of your solution, 
there are five basic proof sources that you can pull from. The first proof source is that of the expert. Depending on the sophistication of your product or solution, an expert can really elevate the credibility of your solution in the eyes of your potential customers. There are experts in every field, so it's not a stretch to think that any given solution could use this source. The more technical the solution, the more appropriate the need for an expert proof source. A good example of this would be a doctor helping promote a new drug or supplement. The next proof source is that of a celebrity. Celebrity endorsements are quite powerful, particularly in the direct-to-consumer space. In the business-to-business -business space, celebrity proof sources are much less common. Next up, we have the user proof source. Regardless of the product or service, when you can demonstrate credibility through the eyes of the end user, you generate significant momentum and influence on new customers. Every website on the planet uses testimonials and reviews now to pitch their products. Using case studies and third-party reference stories in the business-to-business -business space is quite common and can be very effective if done properly. The fourth proof source at our disposal is the wisdom of the crowd. This proof source is like the user proof source, but supercharged. Rather than a specific user experience, wisdom of the crowd taps into our deep desire to be a part of something big as well as our fear of missing out. This proof source uses the mass effect to influence. You know, if billions of people have eaten at McDonald's, then it must be good. If 30,000 people have joined a service, it must work. Volume of customers does equate to credibility in our subconscious minds. Finally, we have the wisdom of peers proof source. This technique leverages the known referral source. If you can generate a reference that the new customer is familiar with, you increase the influence factor tenfold. Now, if you're someone I trust and you refer me to someone who has a product or service that I need, I automatically transfer a portion of that trust onto you. This proof source is the most powerful as it comes from someone the potential new customer knows and trusts personally. One of these proof sources is powerful. But if you combine two or more, you can really differentiate yourself from your competition. Think of the various proof sources you have for your product or service. Create a list of ideas that fall into one or more of the previous categories. Now I want you to create a strategy to create and communicate these proof sources to your potential customer base. Keep these strategies in mind and you'll have one more powerful tool in your sales toolbox. Customers want to know three things once they've decided to buy from you. First, that the solution will deliver what you promised. That will actually solve the problem. Second, that you can implement it effectively and on the agreed upon time frame. And finally, third, that there is continuity of customer service throughout the relationship. These expectations may sound like complete common sense, but you'd be surprised how many businesses don't operate with high marks in all three areas. Let me give you some ideas that will help you more effectively implement your solution. First, create a system by which someone on the sales team is the quarterback of the account. They are the single point of contact throughout the relationship. They should know everything that's happening and get regular reports from delivery on how things are going. They should also have regular check-in meetings with the customer throughout the implementation to ensure satisfaction. If your business has salespeople that are simply hunters and then pass it off, you might think about a team approach by which an account manager is with the salesperson every step of the way. The second thing you can do is to cross-train your delivery team on both customer service and sales. Then you can cross-train your sales team on delivery and customer service. And finally, cross-train your customer service team on sales and delivery. This will create a team environment and break down the silo mentality that I mentioned earlier. Finally, have a system of customer satisfaction meetings and surveys that happen on a regular basis. I would recommend monthly, but quarterly at the least. The customer may not want to do these, especially if things appear to be going well, but you should bake this into the proposal from the beginning. See, many times a decision maker isn't aware that a potential problem exists until it's too late. Then you have to try to involve as many hands-on people at the customer side as possible to resolve it. If you have a commodity or retail product, your focus should be on customer service, as you likely don't have a delivery team per se. 
But for all of us that work in the business to business space, these strategies are critical to seamless implementation and will set you up for future sales within the same account and true customer loyalty for life. As humans, we actually like routine. The familiarity is actually a stress reducer. Our anxiety in general is lower when we know what's coming next and what to generally expect. If you really stop to think about it, we have these routines across nearly all aspects of our personal life. From how we shower and get dressed, to how we prepare dinner, to the homework and evening routine we have with our kids. We have these routines for a very specific reason. We have found that over time, if we do certain things or certain behaviors in a certain order, we tend to get consistent and predictable results. The actual definition of process is a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. Makes intuitive sense, right? However, similar to the previous lesson where we discussed our tendency to resist change, we like routine and process that we create ourselves, but tend to resist the routines or processes that we perceive someone else is making us do. Humans are control freaks. Processes are typically no different. The first reason is that it helps create a consistent voice to the customer base. Too many lone sales wolves on the street, all with different ways of doing things, can create confusion to the marketplace and dilute the brand and the overall credibility of the company. The second reason is consistency of results. Every great sales process should create great results. Your sales process is like your game plan or your playbook. Once the players or the sales team understands the playbook, it should put your team in a winning position consistently. If it doesn't, then parts of your process need to be evaluated and adjusted. The third reason is really no one has arrived as the perfect salesperson. Nope, not even you, sorry. As a result, we know that everyone has room to improve and everyone deserves a good coach. When you have a clear sales process, you and your coach can better identify areas of improvement in your approach. When you think of elements of your sales process today, what do you think is working well? What do you think needs to be improved? Remember, there's a reason why you wet your hair before you shampoo it. There's a reason why you brush your teeth after you eat. And there's a reason why following a clear and effective sales process brings value to you and to your company. Essentially, just like most competitive sports, sales has a series of activities that takes place prior to the sales call, then the sales call, and then a series of activities that happen after the sales call. The elements of an effective sales process fall into one of these three categories. The first is the pre-sales activity, which falls into two subcategories, planning and preparation. In the planning phase, you perform activities such as prospect identification, product research, industry research, competitor research, and call strategy. In the preparation phase, you take the information you gleaned in the planning phase, put it into a written call plan, clear objectives and goals, create the appropriate presentation materials and or tools, build the best stories, anticipate customer objections, and practice for the call. Yes, I said it, practice. The next stage is the customer engagement stage. This is where the planning and preparation get demonstrated at game time. Customer engagement requires a process within the process to maximize your results. Most sales processes have some form of in-call flow they recommend to the salespeople. The one I teach that has had incredible results for folks flows like this. Create connection, followed by identify and prioritize the issues, followed by create credibility, followed by solving the problem. You know this as the presentation portion. Followed by handling any objections and it ends with gaining commitment. In the next lesson, we'll help you get more details behind how to put this model to work in your sales process. Finally, in stage three, post-sales activities, is where we close the loop on the process. In this stage, we do things like solution implementation, 
customer service and support, gather customer feedback, and get the feedback from our manager or coach on what went well and how we can improve the next call. Much like the pre-sales stage, we tend to overlook many aspects of the post-sales stage once we've gained the business. The reality is, this stage is critical to your long-term customer loyalty and results in significant increases in cross-selling opportunities. Research shows time and time again that it's infinitely easier to sell to a current happy customer than trying to bring on a brand new one. Treat your customers accordingly. These are the three stages and the elements contained within a good sales process. In the next lesson, you'll begin to build your own or modify the one you have for maximum impact. In previous lessons, we discussed the importance of a sales process and the elements of a good one. Now you get to take those elements and design a sales process that works for you. We will build this process around the three stages, pre-sales activities, customer engagement, and post-sales activities. As you build your pre-sales activity stage, it's important to be thinking about what knowledge and skills you need that will support your actual sales call and give you the highest likelihood of success. Make a list of things that you need to know about your prospect. Details like title, industry, current solution provider, maybe buying cycle, how did they engage with you, or did you cold call them, or maybe they contacted you in some other way. Next, test your own product knowledge. How well do you know the details of your solution and how it actually solves a problem? What do you still need to know? Who can you reach out to in your company in order to understand it better? How well do you know your competition? Make a list comparing and contrasting your solution with theirs. You should understand their products as well as you understand your own. Now, move into the preparation phase. Do you have a written call strategy? What are your objectives for the meeting? Are they measurable? What do you expect to happen after the meeting? What presentation materials do you need? What stories do you plan to leverage? Make a list of potential customer objections and create a story to combat each one should they arise. Lastly, once you've got all this information in a clear and easy to access plan, practice your call with a coach or peer. Then review it again on your own, visualizing the scenarios. Now you're ready for phase two. As mentioned in a previous lesson, we have found the customer engagement stage works best when you follow a certain order. Step one is create connection. This goes beyond simply rapport building. It requires you to create an introduction story that shares who you are and why you do what you do. Step two is to identify and prioritize the issues the customer is facing. For more information, refer back to the previous lesson on understanding your customer's issues. Next up, we move into creating credibility. This is where you explain through a company story why you and your company are the most credible to solve the problem. From there, you solve the problem by presenting your solution. Think about creative ways to do this through stories and analogies and engaging visuals. Don't be boring and don't be a data dumper when presenting the solution. Use emotion and story-based techniques to maximize the customer's engagement. From there, you can address any objections the customer may have, but do so through narratives, not facts. Don't try to convince them that their objection is unfounded. Simply walk them through a story that shows them their fears are normal, but don't result in the worry that they currently have. Lastly, Gain the commitment. Get them to decide the next step. Most people call it closing, but I teach folks not to close. If you follow the framework I just laid out, by the end, the customers should really close themselves. If they don't, you should reflect back on the steps and see where you might have missed an opportunity. Now you're on to building your last stage, post-sales activities. Make a list of steps that clearly outline for the customer the implementation steps. Simplify things as much as possible. Make it easy for the customer to change to your solution. 
Next, create a customer service contact and resolution process so that you and your customer know exactly what to do should they need help and exactly how each issue gets brought to resolution. Next, create a customer feedback questionnaire. It shouldn't be longer than 10 questions with a mix of ratings and open-ended comments. The last step in this stage is to create an evaluation sheet for yourself. Your manager likely already has one, but if they don't, create one and give it to your manager. Ask them to periodically go on sales calls with you and use the sheet to give you feedback afterwards. Similar to how athletes evaluate their performance on the field, the feedback from your manager is the game film we all need to review that makes us better each and every call. There you have it. You now have a complete framework for a great sales process. Once you apply the details for you and your business, you'll be in great shape to knock your sales goals out of the park. Whether you're a rookie or a veteran salesperson, the number one thing that will determine your success, both in the short term and the long term, is the same for everyone. It's your attitude. We've all experienced that morning where your alarm doesn't go off, you're running late, you jump in the shower, and for some reason your hot water heater isn't working. You finally get on the road, but there's an accident on the freeway on your way to the office. You eventually get to your office, you boot up your computer, and suddenly there's that required critical software update that's going to take at least 30 minutes. So you decide to get a cup of coffee while you wait, only to find that someone used up the rest of your favorite creamer. So how do you think your calls are going to go that morning? Do you think you're going to have some great success on the phone? Probably not. In all likelihood, you're now in a bad mood, and the thought of listening to people tell you no is just going to put you over the edge. Of course, this example might be a little extreme, and frankly, it would put the best of us in the worst of moods. However, there is no question that how we feel when we start to prospect is going to impact our success. To start a great day off prospecting, we have to possess a belief that what we are doing is actually helping people. It doesn't matter what it is that we're selling. What matters is that we are solving a need for a prospect. They may not know that they have a need yet for what we have to offer, but that's okay. We do something that helps people. Now, if we start thinking of prospecting as just a numbers game, we won't have much success. Our prospects can feel that, even through an email or a phone call. Another way to drive our attitude in the right direction is to understand that we have great knowledge to share. We aren't just calling to annoy them. On the contrary, we have valuable insights to share that will help our prospects succeed. We can share stories of other customers that we've helped in the past or give them a view of a situation that maybe they haven't seen before. We are bringing value. Okay, so now our mindset is right. Are we ready to make calls? Probably not. When you study how our brain works, you come to realize that the brain needs some level of justification in order to take action. We often refer to this as the WIFM, or the what's in it for me moment. For example, if I tell you to go run a half mile while it's 90 degrees outside, you're probably gonna say, forget it. However, if I tell you that at the end of that half mile, there are tickets to an all expense paid two week vacation in the Bahamas, your response might be far more agreeable. So it's important to understand that your efforts will lead to success for you, which may take on the form of recognition, money, or job security. The brain is an amazing computing marvel. According to some scientific estimates, the brain calculates over 20 quadrillion pieces of information per second. That's 20 with 15 zeros behind it. But how many of those things can we focus on at one time? The answer is one. For example, have you ever been driving home while deep in thought about something and realized you can't even remember a thing about the last few miles you drove? It's scary, isn't it? See, our subconscious mind was actually driving us along that road. Well, how does this apply to prospecting? Well, the answer is likely pretty obvious. Prospecting, like most things in life, is far more successful when you focus your efforts on the task at hand and avoid distractions. So what kind of things can distract us from focusing on our efforts to prospect? Well, some of them are pretty obvious. Responding to emails, answering calls that aren't related to your prospecting, maybe chatting with people in the office, and the list goes on and on and on. Are there other things that could be distracting you, though? One of the most common distractions I've seen over the years is spending too much time researching your calls, something that's often referred to as paralysis by analysis. 
reps spending time feeling that they need to research the educational background, the job history, and virtually everything about a prospect, thinking that this will actually improve the quality of their calls. When I have asked them how much time they spend researching a call, they usually tell me, yeah, maybe five minutes tops. Yet when I've timed it, they're often spending 20 to 30 minutes or more just researching on one prospect. Think about it this way. Have you ever looked up a topic on the internet and suddenly you look at the clock and an hour or more has passed? It happens all the time. We get engrossed in a topic and suddenly time has slipped right past us. The same thing happens with prospecting. Let's say you're using LinkedIn to research your next prospect. As you look at their profile, you see someone that they're connected with, someone you know, but haven't talked to in years. Without a doubt, that can be useful information on the call. The problem is that we click on that former colleague's profile, we look up their work history to see how they're doing. Then you see someone else you know and think, wow, I didn't know they worked there. And so you click on that profile, and so it goes until pretty soon time has gotten away from us. We get to the end of the day when our goal was to make 50 calls, and we've only made five, yet we were busy the whole time. So how do we combat this? Focus on the task at hand. Make an agreement with yourself that you're only going to spend so much time on research. There are some methodologies out there that are well proven that tell you to look for three interesting points about a person and spend no more than three minutes doing. This way, it's a great way to keep your focus on just your prospecting. Another helpful way to create focus is to schedule your activities and stick to that schedule. For example, check and respond to emails your first 30 minutes of the day, then shut email down for two hours while you prospect. Vocalize to your workmates that you're prospecting and you're not to be disturbed. Set an alarm on your phone for breaks and don't get up until that alarm goes off. Do your research during the last 30 minutes of the day in preparation for the next day. Yes, creating focus is an action, an effort to create a situation where you can stay focused on your prospecting. Create a plan and stick to it, and you'll see the results of your prospecting improve drastically. In sales, we speak a lot about setting goals, and it's no less important in our prospecting. We have long-term goals for our lives and our careers, but in prospecting, it's also important to make sure that we have small, achievable goals on a daily basis. It reminds me a little bit about the metaphor about how do you climb a mountain, one small step at a time. When we start our day, and we know we need to do a bunch of prospecting, especially telemarketing or cold calling, the task can certainly feel like you're standing there at the base of the mountain. This is especially true when we might be a little behind our number for the month. This is why small manageable goals are so important. To start the day off thinking, I'm gonna set five new end user appointments today, might be a great goal, but the reality is that a lot needs to happen before you're gonna hit that goal. Thinking that way is like focusing on the finish line that's still miles and miles away. Like many runners in those endurance races, you may end up quitting before hitting the goal because it starts to seem unattainable. Thinking in terms of bite-sized goals is what will likely produce much more success for you. For example, make a goal for how many calls or prospecting emails that you'll send out by 9 a.m. or maybe before you'll pour your second cup of coffee. Then make a goal to hit by lunch and again before you leave for the day and so forth. If you get an email from someone other than a prospect, tell yourself, I will make three calls, then I'll answer that email. What this is doing is prioritizing your prospecting in your brain and helping you stay focused on the task at hand. What if your daily or weekly targets are company mandated? Will you follow the same methodology and break those targets into smaller chunks to achieve those goals? To be able to achieve goals throughout the day can be very rewarding and actually serves to keep the brain focused on the task at hand. There is no doubt that prospecting can be one of the toughest parts of a salesperson's job, but breaking down the day into manageable goals is a sure way to keep your day progressing and help you achieve greater success. I firmly believe that attitude has to come first when it comes to prospecting. Having the right mindset and attitude will even positively impact your next topic, preparation. When it comes to preparation, I believe that most of us already believe that this is important. What we'll be talking about in this section is really making sure that your preparation is properly focused and helps you achieve greater results. 
The first point of preparation is to make sure we know who our prospects actually are. This may sound simple, but the reality is sales reps often make dials and will talk to anyone who picks up the phone and doesn't hang up on them. Now, this is somewhat like shooting an arrow and then trying to aim. Your conversations change on every call and you don't have a clear presentation or conversation planned in mind. Your success is definitely going to suffer. When we truly understand to whom we are trying to reach and what is of interest to them, we become more accurate with our sales arrows. So how do we do that? This preparation is likely going to have to involve your manager or possibly even your marketing department. If you're a small operation, then it may take you leaning back in your chair and picturing the exact type of client that you're trying to attract. Who is your ideal buyer? Is it the CFO of a medium-sized business? Is it the procurement manager of a multinational organization? Is it the small business owner? No matter who it is, it's critical that you identify that exact person that you want to speak with. This leads to the next part. What is their buying personality, or you may otherwise hear it called persona? Each of those buyers is going to have a different focus. For example, a CFO is typically very busy and is a person who's not going to want to spend a lot of time on the phone. You'll need to be ready with some great insights to attract their attention in a very short period of time. We will discuss those insights in a coming section. If you're dealing with a procurement manager, they're a professional buyer. They talk to salespeople all day. How are you going to differentiate yourself from the others quickly? Now, a small business owner, they might need to be called at odd hours of the day or night and will want to know what it is that you can do to personally help them. The point is that we need to picture that buyer in our mind and anticipate their reaction to our phone call and be ready. If you make calls with a generic script, it's like the proverbial square peg in the round hole. It doesn't work and your success will suffer. However, when you target a specific buyer and understand their persona, you may end up having fewer conversations in a given day, but you will certainly have higher quality conversations in that time period. This is of course just the start of the preparation. Understanding whom we are targeting, what their priorities are and the challenges that they're facing and accomplishing those goals will allow you to approach your prospecting conversation from a position of credibility and differentiate you from the average sales rep. Most of us know a person that just gets us. We have those friends who seem to be able to spot a bad day written all over our face when others around us think everything's fine. We like those people. They're interested in us and we trust them because of it. We know that they have our interests in mind, and we know that they're concerned with what is bothering us and actually want to help us. What if you could come across that way to your prospects? Do you think it would help your ability to make sales in the long term? Without a doubt. Everyone that we speak to is facing a challenge. There's something in their business that they're worried about or should be worried about. What makes a great salesperson is the ability to identify these things and then show them how they can address them. Before we are ready to tackle how we help the prospects solve for these challenges, we must first learn how to identify the unique challenges that most impact our prospects' world. I say they are unique challenges, but it's really in relation to one type of buyer versus another. What you will find in your business is that there are some of the very common themes impacting all buyers of a particular type, such as CFOs or procurement managers, small business owners, etc. For example, studies show that small business owners are very aware of some of the recent changes in healthcare coverage, but very few understand it well enough to actually do something about it. That's just one example of something that might be unique to your buyer, but also somewhat universal. So how do we address these things? Again, preparation is key. Your company likely has a target audience that they understand pretty well. They likely follow industry trends and have some good insights that can be shared with your prospects. The key is that you want to share insights that will be interesting to your prospects, not just something that, that you thought was interesting. You want this to be something that makes the prospects sit back and say, hmm, yeah, that is interesting. 89% of buyers surveyed feel that their interactions with salespeople bring no commercial value to them. That is something that a VP of sales is going to care about. That isn't good. 
This whets their appetite for talking to us about how they might actually fix that. This is what you want when you start sharing insights. So how do you go about getting this insight? You can find these researching sources like LinkedIn, following industries on Google, and sometimes even buried in news articles that your company or prospects are posting on the web. You likely have the same scenario in your own organization. There's no question that it takes time to research these things, but once you have them in hand, you can use them for call after call after call. Having insights gives you a reason to speak with your buyer. This isn't just a prospecting call anymore. You can approach it with the mindset that you have something valuable to share with them, and this changes the entire tone of the call. Even if you don't set an appointment on that call, over time, you'll be identified as a person who provides insight and is a resource to your buyer. They are more likely to take your call in the future and then, when the time is right, meet with you to discuss the possibility of doing business. You'll be considered a trusted advisor, not just a salesperson. Once you've piqued their interest, you have the most important and valuable commodity in the world of prospecting, their attention. Now the real fun begins. When it comes to prospecting, we know that simply making calls and talking to whomever answers the phone or is at the front desk isn't likely going to get us very far. We then actually have to have something to pique the interest of our buyer, something that will shake up their status quo. We do this in the form of insights. These are pieces of information, possibly statistics, which point to a need that our buyer has and is something that may interest them that they haven't considered yet. Once we have their attention, the next key is to be able to properly articulate our differentiators as an organization and show how we can actually solve their problems. If we can't do this part well, our prospecting is useless. Think of it this way. You prepare a beautiful dinner. You get your buyer to agree that they're hungry and agree to come to dinner. The problem is that they're vegan and you are a steakhouse. Your solution must fit their needs. You have to be able to articulate it fluently. Most salespeople feel that they can properly articulate their company's value and differentiators. The problem is that buyers don't agree. According to Forrester Research, 89% of B2B buyers don't think that salespeople bring any commercial value to their appointments. This tells us that we need to be much better at sharing how we are uniquely qualified to solve a problem. The better that we can do this on the prospecting side, the more effective our face-to-face -face conversations are going to be. Articulating our unique solution requires real effort and preparation. We have to understand what a differentiator really is. What differentiates you from your competition and answers the needs of a customer? Would you say customer service is your differentiator? Your competition probably provides customer service as well and likely can point to clients who think theirs is superior to yours. We hear companies say, our people are the differentiators. Does your competitor have people too? I would imagine so. Differentiators need to be specific and not just be cliche. If your product is the only one on the market that is environmentally friendly, made of recycled parts, and lasts longer than the competition by 30%, well, that's a differentiator. The key is to have the insights you provide point towards something that allows your prospect to do something differently than they're currently doing or can do with your competitor. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to necessarily get into a detailed discussion about what your unique solutions are on a prospecting call. There isn't likely time to get into that when they aren't even expecting your call or visit. However, having these unique insights and solutions in mind when you make that call arms you to have a conversation that's both meaningful to the prospect and differentiates you from all the other prospecting calls that they've received that week. So how do we identify these differentiators? This takes both some research into both your company and of course that of your competition. Understand that your competition likely has a very good product, otherwise they wouldn't still be in business. Even so, there are specific things about your product or services that set you apart. These have to be specific and they have to be unique. As a word of caution on this, keep an eye on your competition when sharing these differentiators. In the world of technology that we live in today, differentiators can be changed overnight 
and all of a sudden your competition offers the same thing or possibly even a better version of what you thought was unique before. Understanding and articulating your differentiators is a dynamic part of your prospecting and sales process. So for your homework, make a list of the top features and benefits of your solution. Next, map those directly to how it uniquely helps the customer solve a problem. Finally, describe how solving that problem with your solutions brings direct, measurable impact to your prospect and their business. If you can follow this differentiator roadmap, you'll be well on your way to creating further interest in the prospect setting a face-to-face -face meeting. When it comes to planning your success with anything, be it a vacation or your sales career, wishing success and hoping for success doesn't lead to success. You must create a schedule. If you don't have a defined schedule that you're willing to stick to, you're going to get distracted. In sales, prospecting isn't the only thing you have to do every day. You have appointments and meetings and emails and fires to put out, and the list goes on and on and on. How many times have you said to yourself, wow, where'd the time go? When that statement has gotten in the way of your prospecting, you have a problem. A problem that's actually costing you money. So how do you go about creating a schedule? The first rule is that it has to be something that you're going to be willing to stick to. The schedule can't be continually changing all the time. This will prevent you from getting into a rhythm and keep you from achieving optimal results. The next thing to consider is when people are going to answer. There's much research out there identifying when people are most likely to answer their phones. It varies some by industry and geography, but take the time to research that. Set your schedule around times that people are more likely to pick up the phone. The same holds true if you cold call on businesses in person. These won't necessarily be times that are most convenient to you, but remember, the end goal here isn't just to do a bunch of prospecting, it's to make a sale. Your prospecting schedule should be methodical. There should be times for sending emails, initial phone calls, follow-up phone calls, live visits, etc. In my experience, six to seven touch campaigns can be very effective. There's some great suggestions available for how to run these that can be found with just a little bit of research. Another tip regarding your schedule is to publicize it. Let your manager and your colleagues know your prospecting schedule and that nothing short of an emergency should interfere with that schedule. I've seen reps post a sheet on their wall showing the times and then have another sign that clearly represents that they are prospecting and not to be disturbed. This methodical schedule will allow you to put your focus to work. Have your cell phone set to do not disturb. Close out all of your email programs, close any internet browser windows that don't have to do with your prospecting and so forth. Picture it this way. You're a race car driver speeding through that last couple of laps. You can't imagine pulling out your cell phone to respond to a text message or comment on your friend's Facebook post. The results could be disastrous. Your prospecting time should be treated with the same level of focus. Whatever schedule you decide upon, stick to it and the results will follow. You may have heard the old adage, what gets measured gets done. When it comes to prospecting, the same approach can be very rewarding. In this section, we will talk about the metrics you will hold yourself to as you go through your day and your week. Once you've adopted the right attitude, built an effective schedule, and have your insights ready to lead your conversations, it's about goal setting, execution, and measurement. One important tactic is about breaking down your day and week into definable business practices, not just keeping yourself motivated. This will be the engine in your car. This is what makes your prospecting in conjunction with all your preparation actually work. It's the proverbial rubber meeting the road. Your manager or organization may already have defined minimums that need to be accomplished each day. These are likely designed from an understanding of their business practices and what has worked for salespeople in the organization for some period of time. Those should be looked at as a minimum, not what you as a top salesperson are actually looking to accomplish. There is some truth to the saying that sales is a numbers game. The numbers can vary greatly between reps based on skills, so this is where honest self-examination is needed. You may need to get your manager involved in this as well. If you have used a CRM like Salesforce.com or some other tool, 
you can likely put some examination into how many prospecting attempts that you have made and then see what kind of results that you've achieved. This is not a time for gut feelings. You need to find out your actual success rates. Let's use an example to explain this. Your company may say it takes 100 dials to get one sale, so they set your minimum goal at 100 dials per day. If in reality you take 125 dials to make one sale, you're likely going to be behind quota. Now, Based on this self-examination, you need to set yourself a higher number, at least 125 per day, to stay on pace. The fact that it takes you more calls doesn't make you a bad sales rep. On the other hand, recognizing this fact and adjusting accordingly makes you a very smart sales rep. Using the same example, let's say you figure out it only takes 80 calls to make one sale. That's great. Should you just target 80? That isn't what top salespeople do. The great ones will still target at least 100 dials and know that they are likely going to be ahead of quota. That self-examination and metric setting gets you part of the way. Now it's time for a realistic breakdown of those numbers into your schedule. How many dials or cold calls can you make in an hour? That will vary by industry and what you're trying to sell. Use realistic numbers. Don't just use what you think your manager or others want to hear. Talk to top salespeople in your company and find out how much they can do in an hour and copy that. You may find that you need to adjust your schedule. Sometimes you may need more time. Other times you can actually get away with a little less. Now you have to track it and review your results on a weekly basis. I recommend a CRM tool or something that ties into your phone system, but even hash marks on a page can work. This is your sales Fitbit, if you will. One way or another, track what you're doing and don't lie to yourself. Make adjustments as needed. This is what great salespeople do to keep their performance going year after year. The desire to do this comes back full circle to our discussion of attitude at the outset of this training. So we've talked about attitude, your schedule, how to make successful calls, and how to have metrics that will keep you successful. You're now well on your way to being a consistent top prospecting performer. Without a doubt, prospecting is one of the most challenging jobs in sales. The concept of reaching out to a person who likely doesn't know you and may not even know they have a problem that needs to be solved is fraught with difficulty. However, the rewards can be just as great. Your company may or may not have a system in place for rewarding you for achievement. Big companies have president's club trips or other types of awards. Small companies may have a pat on the back at best. Either way, it's important that you take care of you when you're expending all this energy to prospect. In this section, we'll talk about the importance of rewarding yourself for hard work. Now, some of you may roll your eyes at this section, but trust me when I tell you, it's very important. We already know how important attitude is in prospecting. One of the big reasons attitude is so important is that it carries to and through your prospects. They know whether or not you're having a good day. Your voice inflection on the phone or your facial expressions in a face-to-face -face meeting telegraphs your feelings to a prospect. When you are run down towards the end of a day of prospecting without a lot of success, chances are you're finished the day without a lot of success. Why is that? Whether you realize it or not, your tone has conveyed one of defeat. Ironically, your prospects will imitate that attitude and likely not agree to an appointment or buy from you. It's human nature. I won't get into the whole discussion on mirror neurons, but believe me, they are in play. So how do we combat this? We all have things we'd rather be doing than prospecting. Use those things as rewards. If you hit your goal for the morning, treat yourself to a few extra calories at lunch or two rounds of your favorite game on your iPhone. These little things can help bring your mindset back into the proper place. These aren't necessarily always rewards for success as in selling something or booking an appointment, but rather rewards for accomplishing your activity goals. Again, there's a reason for this. We know that sales is a numbers game at times. This means that if it takes you 100 dials to get one appointment on average, there may be times where you make 198 dials without any appointments and then get two back to back on the next two calls. This is still one appointment per 100 dials, but it's a tough way to get there. Did you do anything wrong? Probably not. It might have been a holiday weekend or one of a thousand other reasons why you didn't get that appointment. 
The trick here is having a little reward for the activity that you're doing and then keep on doing it. The results will follow. The hard part is sticking with it long enough to see the results so the little rewards help keep your mind focused. It can't be emphasized enough that prospecting is one of the hardest jobs of a salesperson. Like most things in life, it comes down to attitude and preparation.